it's going to get ugly fast. And, um, you know, there are a lot of things on the table, which we don't know how they're going to play out. What happens when the, the, the mass deportation agenda that they're professing to start with as their first item, what happens when they start raiding places and pulling people out and pulling people out of their homes and finding places uh, of work where they, you know, are, are grabbing people, randomly stopping brown people on the street and asking them for identification uh, to prove that they are American citizens. Wow, this is our first episode of the Trailblaze podcast since we have had the election. And Jamal, you and I saw each other on election night and we've been trading messages, but this is our first time actually having a real conversation. And I don't know what to, I don't know how to start this. I, I could start it with yeah. some data points. I could start it with how you're doing. And I think all of the understanding Let's... and the feels, all of that's important right now. But I don't know, man, I want to hear from you. Um, yeah, let's start it with how we're doing. I mean, you know, how are you doing? Um, it's been a week. I, um, we've talked on this podcast and in general about how the Trumpism has been very active. It has tapped into something very deep in America's bones and marrow. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Trump never gave up on that. We've had eight unrelentless years of that. The message, the targeting, and obviously it worked. Um, and I wish I could say that I was so surprised and shocked, um, but it just, it's telling me something about who we are as a country and where we are right now. And this idea that you and I had about Trailblaze as a discussion about the America we're becoming, well, it has to start with the America that we are right now. And the America we are right now is not interested in embracing change, not, not, not change in terms of who has power. It certainly wanted change from Biden, I guess. Yeah. So I, maybe I have a little bit of a, of, I do think, I do still think America's, is, I think that the, the trend lines of what's happening in America are undeniable um, mm -hmm. when it comes to the America we're becoming and, and figuring out how we all live here together. Um, we also have to figure out how to address people where they are and deal with people's economics where they are, deal with people culturally where they are. Um, uh, we, meaning those of us who are on the progressive left, can't be in the business of um, uh, telling everybody to eat their vegetables all the time, right? We got to find a way to kind of get culturally alongside people and bring them in. Someone said to me at the, when we were at uh, the hotel, one of the watch parties on Tuesday night, they said, this is some... <laughs> I'm using, this is some gutter shit that's happening right now. <laughs> like, cause he mm -hmm. is just such, he's just such an onerous, uh, odorous candidate, uh, person. Like, you know, he's a criminal, he's an adjudicated sexual abuser. He's had, you know, he's a bankrupt, he's a bad businessman. He's, you know, all the things, right. He's probably going to be a kleptocrat when he goes into office. Cause I think he was born the last time. Uh, so we know all those things about him yet. People still chose to do it, which by the way, they chose to do it while there was a woman running on the other side of the ticket. Mm -hmm. So sexism is real. Racism is real. Mm -hmm. We know that. And we know that people, um, people are willing to tolerate racism and sexism yeah. to get what they want. Yes, absolutely. So, I, and that, so yeah, that is, yeah. that is a deeply American story that has not yeah. changed. Now progress. Absolutely. Like the fact that you and I can exist the way we do, given who our ancestors are, right? Mine coming from colonialism, you know, your at black American heritage, all of that. I get that. Slavery. And I, we can say it. Mine coming slavery. from slavery. Well, I mean, but, you know, <laughs> right. I, I, I'm glad you said it. Um, <laughs> yes. But that's, and then we look at our kids, right? That's part of their yeah. heritage. Like this is, this is, that's so much of what I'm thinking about is in terms of how I feel and understanding is the, I need to explain to my children mm. this moment in time that is going to be so influential on the way that they grow up and, and what, how they navigate the world. And it is, I need to be honest with them, right? I can't, I, I'm not the mom yeah. who's going to sit there and pretend like race doesn't exist. My kid is black, right? Like we don't have yeah. that luxury to do that. And now I'm going to have to somewhere weave in this conversation that, by the way, even within this theory of multiracial democracy and everybody gets a vote and a voice and this, by the way, buddy, the reality is 
people with my skin tone may throw you and your daddy under the bus if they think that they can get something better for themselves. And I'm talking about my skin tone, like, you know, lighter skinned, you know, the quote unquote woman of color, yeah. I'm South Asian, and the ability or access to being okay and everybody's buckling down and be like, okay, I'm going to take care of myself. And that's what I feel like there was such an effort for groups and people to show up. Black women show up for everybody every time. Black men showed up despite all of the drama and chastising for last week. It's the people who were lighter shade who kind of weren't there, right? And yeah. definitely white voters yeah. who said what they want, very clearly what they want in states where abortion rights were on the ballot, white women voted to protect abortion, to protect their health care rights at the state level and did not pull the lever for Harris. There is no way yeah. you can say that this Republican Party or Trump stands for abortion rights. So like, okay, great. I got it at the state level. So I don't need to worry about anybody else but myself. Well, here's like, what we know. That's, that's what it is. We do. And, and we know that women aren't gender voters. I mean, we can just put that to the, yes. to the lie, right? Yes. To the test. We yes. put it to the test twice and we've discovered twice that women aren't gender voters. Women vote on a variety of issues. Um, some of them mm -hmm. healthcare, some of them about their own well-being, some, you know, race, I think. Um, but it does not appear to be that women are gender voters. Um, and that is something that I think, you know, we just all have to sort of accept. And at the same time, I think what we're also having to figure out is as a progressive movement, how do we talk to men? Right. And I know this is going to be an uncomfortable topic. I've been having it with some of my female friends over the last couple of days. How do we talk to men? Because just saying to men, what you've been doing is bad or, 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 or we're changing the society. We want all of us to live together. We actually have to engage men in a conversation about so, what their role is going to be in the society and how is it that the society is going to, if we are going to be multi-ethnic, multicultural, and we're going to have to have the conversation with everybody, including them, about how they participate and engage. Because right now, I think they are lost. I think men are lost, and I think men are angry because the world is changing. They don't get what's happening. They feel lost because of, they feel benefits being taken away from them. I'm not arguing that substantively they're right. I just want to be clear about that. Yeah, I'm not is, arguing you're... that we have to change substance. I am saying, though, as a movement or people trying to build a society, if we don't have this conversation, Donald Trump is having it, and he is steering those men in a direction that is destructive to the type of society we want to build. So, so if we don't have the conversation. Here's, my, here's where I need to jump in on that because yeah. it's a very expansive use of the word we, the word we. Yeah. I was very heartened to see white dudes for Harris. Mm -hmm. That movement needs to continue. I am no longer in a position where I can sit there and tell random men that I feel for them and I hear that I'm so sorry you're feeling a sense of loss. Here's what we can do for you. I, I can't do that because I don't get seen as sincere or I get seen as somebody who's coddling them. Mm -hmm. Well, I, so let me give you an example of what I mean. So um, when I was working for Harris, uh, she was vice president. We went to a, um, a community development bank and we met a woman who had a business. She was starting this business. She wanted it to grow. But she said every day at three o'clock, she couldn't, her business came to a halt because she had to go get childcare. She had to go pick up her kids from school. She didn't have money for childcare. And that's why she needed the childcare tax credit. So she got childcare, she could grow her business. That's not typically how we talk about childcare. We talk about childcare as good for the kid. You know, we want everybody to be able to work. We want it to be like a thing that's going to keep, you know, families together. But we don't talk about childcare in the sense that, you know, how is it that people are going to be able to, start their business or keep their business going? How is it that they're going to be able to work an extra shift at the plant? We don't talk about it from like an economic driver. This is one of the supports that is an economic driver that keeps the, the side going, which are things that men care about. So I think we've got to find a way that when we talk about our policy agenda, we are also talking about it in a way that men are going to hear it and not just talking about it in a way that sort of makes us feel good about the justice that happens in the world and in America. So um, we got to keep that, we got to keep this conversation going around all the elements of our society and not just having a conversation, um, having a conversation where everybody else's inclusion is being talked about. And we're not also talking about how we include uh, men in society and frankly, how we include white men in society. I 
I'm going to just jump in because the, yeah. the liberal use of we, which I get, right? The idea of mm -hmm. progressives, lefties, it, it, everyone's parsing that. We is doing a lot of work right now because as a result of this election, while I was very happy to see white dudes for Harris, white dudes talking about abortion rights for the people in their community, I no longer feel like there is any value in me talking to a man to help him with his feelings and figure out why he feels dispossessed. I have spent so much of my life doing that and understanding that. And it feels like right now it is at the expense of me and my family, our literal safety. I'm not being hyperbolic here. My mm -hmm. parents are immigrants. Our skin type, like we are, we are brown. Everything Trump has said about and how he's operated about Muslims and people who have birthright citizenship, which is how I am. I was born in this country, but apparently that might not matter. Like these are realities yeah. that I now have to confront and project out. I can't just say, oh, maybe that won't happen. He has explicitly told us what he wants to do. I, ex I have to accept that and now calibrate for what is, as a mother, safe for me to be consistently present and uh, you know, good emotional support for my children to be around for them, to not threaten my family's livelihood in any way, and trying to convince white voters that they need to change or adapt. I'm like, I, I think I'm out of that game. I, I think yeah, I'm out yeah. of that game. But like, I, that is, it has not proven to be effective when I do it. People like me mm -hmm. well enough, but it's not effective. So like and like. I will work yeah. on my communities to not be racist. I get that, like where I have entree. But when I'm when I'm talking to a white neighbor who may have voted for Trump or not, my number one focus is: Are things going to be civil? And I'm, am I going to be okay? That's that's what I'm yeah. entering this next phase like. Yeah, and I think that makes a lot of sense. I um, and when I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking about it from the position of like, how do we do this as people who are campaigning or building mm -hmm. movements or building government policy, right? And then how do we have those policies, uh, conversations where other where pe everybody sort of feels engaged and involved? I mean, it wasn't that long ago that we had pe white guys, right? Who are white people who were voting for Barack Obama, right? And who were supporting Barack Obama, who was a black man who was arguing for many of the same policies that we're talking about now. Um, the mm -hmm. difference is, I think, People feel stress. They feel this economic stress. They feel cultural stress. And I think on the progressive left, we are not engaging people where they are. We're more often to say, well, the world is changing. We're all going to have to change with it. Here's where we're going to have to go without really meeting some people where they are and their own feelings about you know being disoriented. And that, it's not going to be for everybody to do, but obviously mm -hmm. what we're doing now is not working, <laughs> right? And there are progressive men who I think will say, like, they feel somewhat left out of the progressive story. They're, they are Democrats and they're voting for Democrats because they believe in the agenda, but they don't really feel talked to. They don't really feel engaged. They don't really feel like their opinion matters in debates. And I think we've got to just figure out, like, our style. This is really like a style question more than it is like how we change, you know, how we change our substance. You know, when I first started in politics, we used to regularly go to events where there was country music and football tailgates and people were drinking beer and eating mm -hmm. barbecue. That was like a normal thing. And now I, I haven't been to one of those things in years. Well, I'm, I'm like sports mom all the time right now, right? So it is <laughs> suburban sports mom. Like this is where I live. And my yeah. version of meeting people where they're at is showing up like myself and being part of the community. And I, I'm, I'm going to double down on these human personal connections and uh, what it looks like to have people feel safe and comfortable being themselves in a community like where you actually live and not, not necessarily being similarly concerned about national systems that right now I don't feel like I can control. And part mm -hmm. of why I feel like I have no influence on that, separate from the decisiveness of this election, is the fact that the Democratic Party as a structure, we are not young people, Jamal. Right. We have families, no. yeah. right? Yeah. We're lucky that we have mortgages. That's where we're at. We're lucky that we have mortgages and student loans that we're still trying to pay off. That's yeah. where we're at. But the Democratic Party structure still looks at us as young people who don't know what they're doing and don't know what we want out of life. So the, the yeah. progressives 
have writ large felt very left out as the of this conversation as decisions get made to create a sense of unity and who gets to be part of that unity, who gets the attention to be part of the unity and who doesn't. Like that's that's part of the ugliness of what's going to come out on the Democratic side from this election. I, you know, it's great to have a seat at the table, but I'm I'm not I'm not feeling like I can push for that table anymore or demand my spot there. Like that was the twenties, twenty year old Nayara, forty ish year old Nayara. Like I got shit I got to take care of for me and mine. And yeah. apparently, if other people can vote that way, then I I need to do that too, at least for a little while. Yeah, no, look, that this that that all makes a lot a lot of sense, and I think we are all in a position where, you know, we're wrestling through it. Like every the, the other night, just sitting there watching the states turn red, right? Mm. States that I had taken for granted, and some of them that were almost like, look, I live in New Jersey. New Jersey was only five points. You know, Biden won New Jersey by double digits. Um, Harris only mm -hmm. won it by five points. Um, so there are a lot of people who live around me who voted for Donald Trump. And again, you know, they were willing to tolerate racism and sexism and corruption in order to get what they think is going to be something else for them. And I don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. um, um, but yeah, the, I don't know what that on. is part is really relevant because I one of my more interesting, we use that word a lot, interesting headlines I saw today was, uh, is a Washington Post headline, and it was the Trump supporter wishes she didn't vote for him after her husband got deported. And the opening lines are about how she voted for Trump proudly, her husband got deported, and she thought he was talking about the other people who are criminals, not her undocumented husband. Right. So oh, yeah, no, reality, gonna reality is going to come hard for a lot of people. Yeah. For yeah, a lot this of is people. Get ugly. Mm -hmm. It's going to get ugly fast. And, um, you know, there are a lot of things on the table, which we don't know how they're going to play out. What happens when the, the, the mass deportation agenda that they're professing to start with as their first item, what happens when they start raiding places and pulling people out and pulling people out of their homes and finding places uh, of work where they, you know, are, are grabbing people, randomly stopping brown people on the street and asking them for mm -hmm. identification uh, to prove that they are American citizens. And then you have people who want to help them, right? So you start having other citizens, because yeah. we saw this before, we saw this the last time Trump was elected, and when they did the Muslim ban at the airports, and people went to the airports, and they started, you know, mm -hmm. protesting to stop it. And, you know, the family separation started happening at the border, and people went down to the border, and they protested, and they sit outside. What happens when that starts happening inside of American cities and people rise to the rescue? And then we have a president who said he's open to using the military to stop American mm -hmm. citizens from doing that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a this is a tricky place where we are. And one can only pray because I'm a person of faith. Uh, one can only pray that there will be some calmer heads around the White House who are just faking it <laughs> to get in the building um, who mm -hmm. will at least chill that. And if it doesn't, and those heads don't exist, then we are headed for a confrontation that could wildly spin out of control. I, if people don't know viscerally what's coming, they just have to read his words and the mm -hmm. words of Project 2025, which now everybody coming out of the Trump operation is like, oh yeah, that's our plan, which we all knew and right. denied it for campaign purposes, right? Like that's, that's what's coming. And we're still in the early days. Um, and so obviously we're trying to rationalize and understand, and I clearly have feelings. Um, but I find it very interesting that pretty much everybody who was on the Harris side of the equation, their first instinct was, Ooh, okay. How's this going to impact me? I need to like, I actually need to figure that out before I can jump to activism before yeah. I can jump to how do I make change? Because that, that feeling of threat is real. It's very right? real. It is real and tangible. And there's no, it is not a, oh, this is just a feeling. The data doesn't back it up. No, the data backs it up because the guy has said these things, right? Whereas- And he's done them. Other, and he's done versions of it already, right? He tried yeah. it. <laughs> and these other versions of, I feel a sense of loss, right? I feel a sense of grievance. I feel a sense of, I don't belong in society- Data isn't backing that up, right? So I don't know how to work with feelings where I can't, I can meet somebody where their feelings are and then hopefully bring them to a rational place. But if that rational place doesn't exist and it's been rejected over and over again, 
right? Rejected over the last four years of bringing people to a different rational place. I don't know what else to do. That's, this is the conundrum. And like no amount of messaging is going to change that if the messengers, I don't know who the messengers need to be. Right. Well, I think you hit on something earlier too, when you started talking about where the work can be done. And I think mm -hmm. some of this is we got to dig in deep in the places where we live, right? And try to make yeah. those places safe havens and places where um, we can build state and local laws that will protect people and give people a sense of security and make sure that the institutions that exist where we are, are looking out for people. Um, and then I think as, as movement builders, we've got to think about how we get back on the side of the outsiders, right? Like, I don't mm -hmm. think this is a left right conversation. I don't think this is mm -hmm. conservatism versus liberalism. It's like, it's like 3d politics. This is inside out, right? These are the outsiders versus the insiders. And for too much, those of us on the progressive left look like the elite insiders and Trump has been able to sort of identify him and his people as the people outside who are trying to fight us. But the truth is our people are more outside than anybody, right? Like if you look I at mean, the literally like data, you, you and me, for stuff, like, all of the access that we've had and we've known and understood, you and I still have had to function like outsiders, which is why we're able to have these conversations. Yeah. So in theory, people like you and me can help be the bridges. I, I just don't know how that gets translated or how that works beyond like it's, I think it's I think it's look the human connection and it's, it's human connection and it's inside these communities because what we did see mm -hmm. also the last time Trump was in office we saw places like California and New York and some places where they in big cities that began to say okay we are going to take care of our people here's what we're going to do here to make sure and no we're not going to cooperate with the worst instincts or the worst directives mm -hmm. that come from the federal government. If it means I'm not going to send my police department out to start rounding people up. You want to do that? You can send ICE in here and we can't stop you. We can't stop you. But the local PD is not going to be a part of that process, right? So trying to build and figure out how we create these berms so that everybody, people who are locally can feel as protected mm -hmm. as possible. Um, because we could get to a place where, you know, um, it, we, th there are just places where I'm kind of, uh, uh, retreats, right? Communities become retreats mm -hmm. where, you know, I just got to get to your house, right? In your state. And then you just got to get to mine so that you can come and see our family. But the places in between those houses could be Mississippi, mm -hmm. right? 1952 Mississippi. Well, and there was a reason why Maryland there was a green Rangers. book, right? There was reason. Yeah. So you knew where you could be safe. That's right. And it's in our bloodlines to know when we walk into a room or you walk, you get out at a gas station and you're like, this ain't right. Something Look, my ain't right dad here. used to tell me in Michigan when I grew up, um, you know, sort of Detroit was here and then Lansing was mm -hmm. here, which is where Michigan Damn. State was. And yes, you know, this is how you learn geography when mm -hmm. you're in Michigan. Your hand is up. Um, but to get from your thumb to the middle of your palm where, you know, Michigan State was when I was a teenager, my dad would say, you got to get gas here at home. Don't stop until you mm -hmm. get to Lansing. When you get to Lansing, get gas before you, you know, there, and then don't stop till you get back home. Because there were all these towns in the middle, like Howell, Michigan, and all these places mm -hmm. where, like, they had Ku Klux Klan activity. This is like, mm -hmm. you know, the 90s, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. right? <laughs> where this was happening. And I will so. say that this, for, for my family bloodlines, if we want to talk about it that way, I mean, the, the separation of India and Pakistan along mm. tribal and religious lines was the most violent and brutal mass migration of people that we have seen in modern history, right? Yeah. That is what my family story is. My parents did not came up under literal military dictatorships, yeah. right? And then they came for the promise of America. Yeah. And now in their late stage, they are very, they are aware of what this is and what yeah. just happened in the election. They had a moment of sadness and they are now drawing back on their skill sets that they had when they were younger. And that's, that's what I look at. I'm like, okay, we know how to handle this. The experiences are there because they're part of human history. I don't like, and it makes me so sad for my parents that this is what they're going to see in their twilight years, right? Yeah. Because we have, we, we have been, and we can be better. I heard a story. I, I, so I, so I sit here in the middle, right? This middle, the sandwich generation that we yeah. talk about where we've got elders and we've got kids. I'm like, all right, all right. It, this, this, this is, this is now, this is our project is to help the younger ones, this the little ones who you know, 20 years makes a massive difference. This is our project. I was at dinner last night and someone told me a story about a friend of ours whose mom just died. And um, it, 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 so it's an older friend, like a mentor whose mom just died. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story, which was so interesting, was 
my friend saying that she went and sat with this woman before she was 97 years old, right? And she went and sat with her last weekend because they knew the end was coming. And the woman said that um, she wanted to vote for Kamala Harris. And so they wanted to make sure she did. And she voted absentee. Mm -hmm. But she said she wasn't so sure she was going to stick around for election night. And she said, why yeah. not? She said, I don't know. I'm not sure how this is going to work out. Mm -hmm. And literally, she passed away on election day. Wow. <laughs> literally passed away on election day. Like, mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. is something, I think, like you said, it's in the bloodline. Like, she just sniffed it. She was like, mm -mm, mm -hmm. I know everybody says this might work out. She's like, I'm going to do my part. I want to vote. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to. I don't. I, in my in my mind, we were talking, we were kind of laughing a little bit about it last mm -hmm. night because we are telling good stories about it. Um, she was like, yeah, she's like, in my mind, in her mind, Kamala Harris won and everything's fine. <laughs> right? And that, that was what? Bless that it. Was, exactly. Bless that was her it. exit yes. music. <laughs> yes. That was her exit music. She didn't want yes. to know if it wasn't going to work out that way. I'll leave that up to you guys. You guys can work that out on your own. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. well, um, this was... Um, resilience, right? Resili resilience. Resilience is the thing. And... We need some time to recalibrate, but the resilience is going to be there. Yeah, we're we're going to figure something out. We're going to um, it just can't be what we've been doing for this long, because the clear message is what we've been doing isn't working. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. All right, good mm -hmm. to talk to you, my friend. Take care of yourself. Thank you, Jamal. Family. Love to your family. You too.